Hello and welcome. Does religion preach violence and is that violence contained in the Holy Scriptures? Critics of Islam accuse the religion of promoting aggression, while there are those who see such parallels in the Bible. So which of the two contains passages that are more inflammatory, the Quran or the Bible? When the Al-Qaeda leader Osama bin Laden declared war on the West, he quoted the Quran's command to, quote, strike off the heads of unbelievers. After the attacks of September the 11th in the U.S., many in the West blame the Muslim scriptures for inspiring an ideology of violent jihad. American Christian evangelists and conservatives re relentlessly criticize Islam as a religion of war. Well, given that legacy, one of the world's leading religious scholars set out to study the aspects of brutality in both holy books, and what he has found may surprise you. Today we ask, what is the role of the Quran and the Bible in inciting violence through the ages? Remember, you can join our conversation with your questions and comments. You can send an SMS or an email. Now, joining me for uh, the show is Philip Jenkins, author of that study called Dark Passages, where he compared the violent texts in the Quran and Bible. He teaches history and religion at Penn State University. He is also a distinguished senior fellow at Baylor University's Institute for Studies of Religion, which is based in Waco, Texas, from where he joins us. And here in Washington, D.C., we have Sheikh Shakhar al Sayed, Imam of the Dar al Hijra Islamic Center in Virginia and the former Secretary General of the Muslim American Society. Now, I welcome you all to the show, but I should start out by pointing that many, uh, we had so many emails from people questioning the premise of this show. Uh, many people were worried that even discussing this issue was blasphemous, both from Muslims and Christians. And many people even asked us to cancel the show on such grounds. So I want to emphasize that we're not, not out to offend anyone or to judge any religion here, but considering how widespread the misinterpretations are and how they're being used for political purposes, we felt that it was important to cover the topic. And Professor, on that note, I want to start out by uh, asking you about your study and, uh, and the uh, article you've written, the paper you wrote, uh, in reference to violence in both the Quran and the Bible. What exactly did you find? What I was doing was uh, looking at the violent and bloody passages in the uh, Bible. I think for many, uh, for many Christians and Jews, what they think about uh, is passages of um, love and uh, forgiveness, and those passages are certainly there. On the other hand, uh, a large section uh, of the Bible, the section that the Christians call the Old Testament, I includes not just injunctions to war, but of a particularly ferocious kind of war, which has a specific name in the, uh, the Old Testament, which is harem. And what um, harem means is a war in which no mercy can be shown. When, for example, uh, the children of Israel uh, capture an enemy city, they're told to exterminate every man, woman, child, and even all the, um, all the animals uh, uh, in, uh, in the town. And that kind of destruction is mentioned on many occasions as something that uh, great figures of the Bible like Joshua and Moses actually uh, carried out. So um, there are other passages. Yeah, uh, Professor, yeah, well, Professor, I wanted to ask you, so how do you regard the debate about uh, violence in the scriptures? Is it something that's uh, basically theologically academic that's been made political or is there something deeper in it, uh, such as a, a sort of call to arms, so to speak? Well, I look at the history and I can point to many instances in uh, history where uh, Christians and to a lesser extent Jews have actually taken these passages uh, as literal um, calls to arms. And the example would be, for instance, when um, European countries were colonizing Africa or Asia, they would uh, cite these Bible passages as justification for a very ferocious kind of, uh, kind of war. One of the great enemies in the Bible of the Hebrew people is called the Amalekites. And uh, these are to be destroyed without mercy. And there are certainly instances in uh, the story of colonialism and imperialism um, where uh, modern day nations will fight an enemy as if they are fighting the Amalekites and I in a much uh, bloodier kind of war than would normally be considered accept uh, okay. acceptable. Well, so this is a theme that goes beyond the theological. Well, sir, let me uh, bring in uh, Sheikh Shakhar al Sayed. Sir, good to have you here as Thank well. Thank you. Uh, and on, on this issue, Islam has suffered extremely from negative image, and uh, it's often portrayed as, uh, by its critics as the religion of violence. What, what do you feel the critics have most got wrong? What is it that's most misunderstood? What the critics got wrong is, first, the idea that the Quran uh, in, uh, encourages or incites its followers to attack others because of religion. There is no text in the Quran to support it. Dr. Jenkins can support that, can look at that. Also, the Quran does not encourage violence altogether. Even in the battlefield, the Quran says, if they turn towards peace, turn towards peace. 
And if they want to deceive you by pretending they want to turn towards peace, you also have to accept their turn into peace and turn into peace. And Allah will support you. So th there is no similar reciprocal text that I could find, maybe Dr. Jenkins can tell me, in the Bible or the New Testament that says in the battlefield turn towards peace even at a deceitful invitation. Now Sheikh I've got a couple of quotes from the Quran and from the Bible and I'll read it from these uh, holy scriptures uh, and, I'll, and I'll get Dr. Uh, Professor Jenkins in just a second but let me let me put a couple here to you that come in and these are considered inflammatory from those who criticize it. Uh, yes. From Quran, the Quran there's slay the idolaters wherever you find them, arrest them, besiege them and, and lie in ambush everywhere for them. And then there is another one that says those who make war against God and his apostles shall be put to death or crucified. So again, it, there's a suggestion, which is what the critics pick up on. What is, where is the misunderstanding coming in there? Well, the, uh, the misunderstanding is to take this text out of its context. You go back a few verses before. Mm -hmm. It says only one ayah before this ayah, which is ayah number 190, chapter 2. It says, fight only in the way that Allah prescribes for fighting and fight only those who fight you and never commit aggression. That is the passage before that. But then in the battlefield, that's where the other verse comes. And then if you kill them, if you fight them, kill them wherever you find them, which is in the battlefield. Otherwise, we would have been oblivious and not Muslims, not following Islam, if we let any non-Muslim live around us. That would be crazy. It would be even suicidal for a Muslim to believe, or non-Muslim, that Muslims are out, sit out there to do that. because. Christians lived with Muslims for centuries in various places. There was never a single case of genocide against non-Muslims. Mm -hmm. Because uh, this ayah, if understood the way you say it, the way it's misunderstood, mm -hmm. it would have been ordering Muslims to commit suicide against their own neighbors, which is uh, ridiculous. Let me bring uh, Professor Jenkins in here. Professor, in a couple of uh, passages from the Bible which are considered uh, inflammatory here, sir. Uh, the first one from Deuteronomy. Uh, I will make my arrows drunk with blood while my sword devours flesh, the blood of the slain and the captives, the heads of the uh, enemy leaders. And uh, another one which uh, I'll put to you as well. It says, when the Lord your God brings you into the land you are entering to possess and drives out uh, before you many nations, then you must destroy them totally, make no treaty with them, and show them no mercy. To what degree is there, as, as uh, the Sheikh has just uh, explained to us, the misunderstanding with the, the Quran and its uh, text, what is there to, uh, to sort of also support that there are elements here misunderstood? Is there anything that you found? The passages you quote are undoubtedly uh, there. They describe this very ferocious, very bloody uh, uh, kind of war. Uh, the question, as for any scripture, is whether it is describing um, rules that should have prevailed at a particular time in history but would no longer prevail later. They would no longer be binding on somebody fighting a war in the contemporary world, for example, um, as opposed to uh, eternal um, uh, condemnations. And uh, uh, somebody looking at the Bible would say, well, those laws applied at some particular point, but they were later uh, overruled. Um, on the other hand, I can certainly point to people who have taken the Bible and the Quran in later years um, and taken those as literal instructions for the present day. Whether they were reading it uh, correctly, uh, I, um, I cannot say. But those passages are there and uh, they okay. are very, very difficult to take. I'm going to put a couple of emails uh, to both of you gentlemen. Uh, and um, uh, Professor, I'll start with you here. It says, uh, this is from Leila, who, who wrote into us uh, with this email saying, people who compare religions in this way are why Muslims and Christians are at each other's neck. Muslims and Christians are supposed to be united as one, but any effort to reconcile is quickly blown away by things such as asking which religion is more violent. So, so I wonder, Professor, is there, is there a danger in, in, in your study looking and comparing violent passages that you perpetuate the, the image of violence associated with religion rather than looking at the the aspects that might uh, d uh, disassociate uh, violence from those religion and encourage the, the peaceful aspects of them you see m my intention is absolutely to the contrary my intention is to say that passages in the Bible have become dead letters for most Christians and Jews what I am trying to say is that because there are passages in the Quran that sound bloody or violent. Uh, this does not make the Quran a bloody text. It does not make Islam a religion of blood. So what I am trying to do is to lay the basis for the kind of reconciliation, for the kind of unity, the kind of harmony that your correspondent 
so, uh, so rightly wants. Mm -hmm. But I think there is um, a dangerous idea, and particularly, as I say, for Christians and Jews, that they so ignore their own scriptures, that they become self-righteous. They believe that they have not had to wrestle with these in the past. Yes, they have. They have overcome them. And any religion can deal with these, but not by ignoring them. So I'm speaking about a process of truth and reconciliation. Okay, well, I have an email also for the Sheikh, but we'll get to that in just a moment. Gentlemen, I ask you to stand by while we take a short break. We'll have more of our discussion when we return. <laughs> Welcome back. We're discussing passages in the holy books of Christianity and Islam which are accused of inciting violence. While well, recent events have led many to condemn scriptures in the Quran for allegedly inciting violence, one of my guests, U.S. religion historian Philip Jenkins, who's researched both books, says the Bible contains far more verses praising or urging bloodshed than does the Quran. Professor Jenkins joins us from Waco, Texas. Here in Washington, D.C., we have Sheikh Shakhar al Said, Imam of the Dar al Hijra, a mosque in Virginia, and the former Secretary General of the Muslim American Society. And, and uh, Sheikh, I have uh, an email for you, which came in from Nairobi in Kenya, yes. uh, from Jens Oppelman, that says, what is the point of even analyzing and broadcasting this, thereby possibly even furthering the divide? Isn't it more important for us as individuals and as a global society to apply and translate, uh, to translate both teachings into today's world in a way that we can prevent conflict together? Well, the Quran does not promote conflict. The Quran, whenever it addresses violence, it is in the context of being attacked, its followers being attacked. It, the only permission that came to fight back came to the Muslims after full 13 years of extermination type persecution by the pagans and the permission came in a form of a permission so the Quran is not bloody it doesn't talk about shedding blood it also talks about many other things reconciliation is yeah. better one one thing Sheikh, that the uh, Islam has to contend with is now in the modern world especially in the context of being in the West as well mm -hmm. uh, that there are incidents that that really hurt the religion and and it's uh, and it's true mission or it's true uh, message uh, of course when we had December last year the young Nigerian Muslim man uh, Omar uh, Farouk Abdul Muttalib uh, tried to blow up a commercial airliner of course uh, the pretext given there is that he's following instructions from the religion and I wonder what can be done to actively discourage this kind of thing well in the community. It, I don't know how much it hurt the religion when the Serbians attacked Muslims in Bosnia. I don't know how much it hurt religion when Catholics and Protestants killed each other in Northern Ireland. So I believe Islam has been singled out in the West by misconceptions and cumulative mishandling of the religion, whether by academia or the media or politicians, each for their own purpose. But I believe whenever a Muslim dog barks, it is a terrorist act. But whenever a, 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 a Christian lion bites, then it is an, you know, it's a crime. Professor Jenkins, uh, one, one issue I wonder is how much are cultural values and uh, traditions being confused with true religious teachings? And an example I could give perhaps is that, you know, women in Saudi Arabia not being allowed to drive. Of course, cars didn't exist at the foundations of Islam, you know, 700 plus years ago. I wonder to what degree that confusion is being manipulated politically. Oh, uh, certainly, and I, I would take that across um, every religion, not just um, I I Islam. Uh, th there are times, for instance, in uh, Christian history, in particular societies, where they've had forms of um, honor killings and, uh, uh, and violence. That results from a concept of honor, which then becomes attached to the uh, religion and then becomes a justification for, um, for violence. Um, my whole point is, um, if people are going to use scriptures to justify acts like this, let them be honest, let them be frank with the scriptures and know what's there and put it in, uh, in context and uh, not distort it and not impose cultural ideas and above all racial ideas on top of these to justify crimes. Uh, Sheikh, as, as uh, obviously it becomes incumbent upon religious leaders who are the guide for many people, you know, many of the faithful, uh, to make sure the right message is promoted. Right. What do you do as a, as a prominent religious leader, prominent Muslim, uh, someone who has the ears uh, of the young, of the larger uh, Muslim community, especially in this region here, um, what do you do to, to make sure people understand the right message and don't get drawn down a path of extremism? Well, uh, we teach people the true meaning of religion. We teach people to live by the ethical and value foundations of the religion. And whenever an issue is raised, we guide them to ask about it. 
ignorance is at play very badly here. When Osama bin Laden made his position known, Muslim scholars immediately jumped on his point of view and told him that is not Islam, that's un un Islamic, that's unacceptable. And all the Muslims came along and said, not in my name, you cannot do that. But it's still, we in the West are still saying Muslims have not condemned it yet, they have not condemned it enough, and so on and so forth. I believe we are asked to be better than the angels. And, and there is a limit as to how much you can do. But uh, can, can something more be done? And if that's what it takes to, to change the image, to, to help the religion, can something be done more from the Muslim if, side? If, if, if we uh, open up, which we do, we open up, our mosques are open, our homes are open, our uh, places are open for everybody. We host dinners and invite neighbors. And we have very good relationship with our neighbors in Fort Church, Virginia, and in the Northern Virginia area altogether. And I believe Muslims have to reach out to others and educate them about what Islam is really about. The, the problem is there is a media with a bias mm -hmm. out there putting a barrier between Muslims and their neighbors. Professor Jenkins, I wonder to, to what degree, you know, the fact that the world is globally interconnected and, and much of that world, of course, is in the West that's connected uh, uh, large, largely Islamic countries and sort of uh, those with high... Uh, Muslim populations are in the developing world and I wonder to what degree that has helped to uh, distort the picture of Islam because those who uh, who have access to the modern technology and media are able to to twist the message to their means the uh, they can twist the uh, message but it it's a more uh, basic problem. I mean, the, the degree of uh, ignorance, not just in uh, the, the media, but uh, through the academic world, through the political uh, world, is just uh, so stunning. It's, uh, it, it, it's so complete. Yeah. And you know, in, in, in my experience, even when uh, the media say something which is, uh, would, would be flat untrue, it's often not from the point of view of malice. It's a simple, genuine uh, ignorance, and they are prepared to listen. So I think that for uh, religious leaders like for, uh, the Sheikh, or for academics like uh, myself, the main thing we have to do is to um, is, is to educate, is to um, fight uh, fight ignorance. Right. And Sheikh, of course, one of the issues is that many you know there may be a generational gap here that many people carry a certain baggage either through a sense of persecution or a sense of being you know treated unfairly in general. I wonder to what degree it's important to target the youth to make sure they, often the ones with the most vulnerable minds, are the ones who are most uh, protected from the misunderstandings. We try to reach out to youth, but youth are more emotional than you can capture all of them. And it takes only one renegade youth to do anything awful. What I urge everybody to do is to take a seat back and don't make 9-11 the remarkable history it shouldn't be. It has done a lot of damage, both for Muslims and Islam, much more, I, I think, than what it did to us, even though what it did to us here in America is, is extremely unacceptable and, and awful. But we need to take a seat back and say, where do we go from here? In what that context, question mm, has not been asked. I wonder, Sheikh, in what context do you say that an incident such as 9-11 should be uh, taken? Of course, the media has used it as an excuse, perhaps. It uh, has been used as a linchpin to nail any Muslim with anything. Even a Muslim who violates immigration law is now charged with terrorism first. And when it doesn't stick, immigration sticks. So we have to be reasonable how we're dealing with this, how we are manipulating for political reason an incident that people paid, paid with their blood. The 3,000 who died in New York were not all non-Muslims. There were Muslims among them. Right. So we have to be sensitive to each other. Before I get back to the professor, uh, Sheikh, let me ask you about the, the issue that many of the religious parties have faced, particularly Muslim parties in the West, and charities. What impact have you seen on the way they are regarded and treated? The Muslim parties? Uh, you know, Muslim, uh, sorry, Muslim charities in particular in the West, and of course the way Muslim parties, uh, political parties outside uh, in, in countries where there are Muslim parties, how they are regarded? They are regarded as the source of the problem. You know, like Islamic centers is now are subject to FBI scrutiny, not only scrutiny, but what they call infiltration program, as if we are also in a cave in Tora Bora in Falls Church, and they want to infiltrate as we are closed. We're not closed. All Islamic centers are open for everybody. There is no need for the FBI to say infiltrating Islamic centers it, it, or closing down charities or taking the money 
you know, for fitter and seizure yeah. unnecessarily. And then in two or three or ten years, we discover it was not necessary. That's it, wrong. It does hurt you, the Sheikh, when you have uh, certain uh, people, certain imams associated with a negative message in Islam, like we've had in, in, in places like in London, in mosques in London and, and other mosques around. Of the course, you're well. bound to find our Muslim Jeremiah rights who have extreme views and have their own political agenda, we are bound to find some Muslims like that. Okay. And it's not strange. Professor Jenkins, a thought from you then, sir. What can be done about this? What can be done about these misunderstandings? You've, you've researched this in, you know, very thoroughly. What do you feel can be done to, to move on? And, and as you say, I mean, Islam has, uh, you know, the way Christians and Jews have moved on, what can Islam do to move on? You know, in, in the context of America, uh, one thing I'd stress is just the context uh, is the matter of time. Uh, if you go back a uh, hundred years ago, for example, the way Roman Catholics were regarded in the United States was very much the way Muslims are regarded uh, now. They were regarded as being, uh, you know, think of any stereotype you like. They were regarded as being violent, fanatical, prepared to uh, take over the country. Um, you add time, you add some, uh, a, a, a few decades of interaction, shared experience, and uh, of, of course Catholics are, uh, you know, more American than, uh, th than other Americans, and uh, that, that, is, uh, that is important. But uh, I, th the most important thing for me is to, uh, is to discuss, and to discuss honestly, and n not to try and forget or ignore so many uh, bad passages in the scriptures, so many embarrassing episodes uh, in history, but to uh, look at these frankly, uh, share uh, experiences and feelings, and then move on from there. All right, Professor Jenkins, thank I thank you very much for taking part. And Sheikh as well, it was good to have you on, this, uh, you on the show as well. Thank, thank you, sir. You. Thank you, Thank you for much. being with us, too. Thank you. Now, being, uh, beginning next week, be sure to follow the show at our new time as we move four hours earlier to 16.30 GMT. That's 12.30 p.m. on the U.S. East Coast, 5.30 p.m. in the U.K., 6.30 p.m. in Cairo, and 10 p.m. in India. And remember, you can follow the show on Facebook to see what we're up to there. You can give us feedback on topics, and you can also post your questions and comments. That's it from me and the team here. We'll see you next time.